Hey everybody and welcome to a brand new episode in my series entitled Diana Ross, the RCA Years. Diana Ross quit Motown in 1981. She went to RCA for 10 years and during those 10 years she made six incredible, incredible albums in which she had absolute creative control. She chose the material, the artwork, the style of music that she was going to work with and she produced quite a bit of the music and she had producers but she was quite in charge of everything and today we are continuing with this incredible album much awaited because there's a lot to talk about in this album entitled Ross simply and let us take a second to contemplate the incredible incredible art work and the album cover and the photograph which uh, a lot of fans were taken aback because Many people said it did look like Diana Ross. I mean, of course, when you see this, it can only be Diana Ross. But the face, let's say the expression, is slightly different. She just looks a bit different. The bit more of a stern look, a bit meaner. Diana Ross always looks, she smiles in quite a bit of her album covers, but when she doesn't smile, she has a very beautiful, peaceful look, like on The Boss or on the Diana album where she's not smiling. Um, and, but on this album cover, it's just, you know, attitude. But this is the 1980s. It was all about fashion models, about the superstars, about the very, very heavy makeup on the eyelids and uh, just an incredible photograph. Now, this um, uh, album came out in 1983, June 9th, 1983. So practically a month to the day where she did one of the highlights of her career and where she wore a little something like this in Central Park, you know, for a casual stroll in Central Park where Diana Ross did the legendary uh, Central Park concert suck because obviously the first concert was rained out after 40 minutes and that is what made this concert so legendary because Diana Ross in the dark with almost no lights uh, with uh, the microphones going off and the things becoming very very dangerous for her public but for herself and she refused to leave the stage although she was soaked and she um, stayed until she was sure that her fans were safely out of the park. So this is a very, very wild time for Diana Ross. And the album comes out a month before. And uh, of course, the concert did quite a bit for the sales and for um, talking about this album. Now, musically, only eight songs. So that's uh, just like The Boss, you know, that had only eight songs. It's a short album and um, the choice of songs is very um, diverse, although most of the album is produced by one producer. and There's actually just two producers on this album. So uh, the most of the album is produced by Gary Katz. Diana Ross produced one track, the very last track, and uh, Ray Parker Jr. produced two. Ray Parker Jr., who was really hot at the time because he had had uh, this, uh, this phenomenal worldwide hit with Ghostbusters. So um, this was something pretty hot to have a producer like him. The very first song on this album is called um, That's How You Start Over. I adore this song. It begins the album, I would say, like no other Diana Ross album. It starts with the piano, a slightly hesitant piano, and then an orchestra just picks up. And then once you have the trumpets, it's just poof, an explosion. It has a vibe that you would call um, West Coast. You know, there's just the, the orchestra is so clear and very, very um, vivid. It's very jazzy. And then all of a sudden, Diana Ross arrives regally, I must say, you know, her very first words, it may seem like the wrong time. And Diana Ross is so poised. She's not 
here to scream. She's not here to say, you know, I'm the voice. This is, you know, the album of the century. She just arrives and she just gets right in. And she is another musical instrument. Um, and it's just absolutely beautiful. The second song right away is what I always call the second Diana Ross songs on many, many, many of her albums. The second song just comes down and it's slightly more of a dream. The, you cannot quite recognize the instruments. Now this is 1980, so there's a lot of syn synthesizers, but this is Diana Ross and this is a Diana Ross production. So there are over 50 musicians on this album. It's a, it's a very, very big personnel. And at the time, some albums were made with six musicians and some of them did everything and, and the synth did, you know, the, viola, the violas and everything else. This is a huge production again. And um, the second song, Love Will Make It Right, is also the premise of what we call the new Jack Swing much, much, much later on, where the background vocals are just as important as the lead vocal. And Diana Ross has this way of just, you know, commanding any song. And so when she's on it, even if she just makes an appearance, it's her song. But the background vocals are quite powerful. Now she's part of the background vocals also in some of the songs, but um, it's just absolutely beautiful. It is a song that was not a hit and that is not, you know, a favorite among all of her fans, but I really um, think that it's so worth listening to again today because it's quite um, a feat to be able to uh, have a song that is so 80s in its production and that is today so relevant and so beautiful and the solo instruments uh, don't sound like like just a button they really sound like something instrumental and it's extremely extremely beautiful and Diana Ross is so sensual in the way that she does just like in her first RCA album where she sings Sweet Surrender, which is the second song, and it's the same thing, you know, love will make it right, and it's just absolutely precious, and I always tell you one of my favorite songs on this album, well, the two first ones are really some of my favorite. Uh, then a song called You Do It, which was at the same time a hit for Sheena Easton. Um, and it, it is a famous song, but um, uh, Diana Ross didn't make it a hit. But it fits her very, very, very well. It's a one-to-one -one song, you know, woman to man. And it's just, you know, very cute and charming and, uh, and very uh, forward. Um, after that comes the controversial song of the album, which is Pieces of Ice. Now, Pieces of Ice was the single that was pushed forward uh, with a very expensive video clip and video-esque clip of the time. This is the video clip with the dancers and with the special effects and, you know, with images and everything. Diana Ross is absolutely magnificent on this clip. Um, she has a two costume change, actually two in one. Um, she appears with no hair because she has a bodysuit, uh, which is uh, so like this. Uh, this was a uh, cat suit, and you uh, let me take a second here. This is the fashion designer speaking. Diana Ross launched the cat suit on the stage. So today, when you see Beyonce wearing the cat suit, when Diana Ross sings happy birthday to her, which was such a beautiful moment, um, when you see J Lo, when you see Britney, when you see everybody. She was the first. Diana Ross went to Central Park and she said, I'm not going on stage in a gown because this is a park 
and it's going to be kids and they want to have fun and they want to be on the lawn and they're going to be wearing jeans and t-shirts and having fun in the sun. So she found a designer and she created the idea of the bodysuit. Now, on the first night she wore this one, well, not this one, um, obviously, but this is my version. But um, I was very fortunate to get the pattern of the coat and it's the same pattern as the one that she's wearing, um, that she owns. But the, um, and, oh, and also in a, a biography, they said that the uh, coat was lost. It flew away and it's absolutely not true. It was, uh, uh, it was never lost and it was cleaned and it was returned and uh, Diana Ross actually wore it again on stage um, later on with different outfits. So she never wore the bodysuit. Um, so on the second night she wears, a, you know, because she wasn't expecting to have a second show. So they quickly, quickly fixed up the bodysuit that she's wearing on the video clip Pieces of Vice and they cut a V in the neck because the one on piece of ice is, has a high neck and Diane Ross needs it to be open so that she can sing. So, and it also was hurting her, her neck because it was cut and um, the sequence when they're cut, it's like pieces of ice. So um, the video clip is pretty amazing, pretty modern for the time, still looks amazing today. Um, although, I mean, it, with today's technology, they would have done something else. And she is just absolutely magnificent and stunning. And the last shot, you see Diana Ross in full hair. Um, the the, the uh, single did peak at number 30 something. And uh, it, it was a hit all around the world, more or less, but because of the video clip and people knew the song, but it is a strange song, not strange, but strange for Diana Ross. But it's a kind of, I always say, love hangover. You know, it's just the music and the, the voice and, and, and all that. But it is a favorite among some of her fans. And I just wanted to say a word about a, um, a young man who is an incredible artist who has created dolls um, representing Diana Ross in 80 of her different famous outfits and who also wrote a beautiful book called Pieces of Ice inspired by that song and he is a major contributor to all of the reissues, of the incredible reissues of the Diana Ross albums that I always tell you about, like the Diana Ross album, the Diana um, Baby It's Me and all that. You always have uh, uh, him being thanked uh, because he is a major contributor to all of the history of uh, these albums and of the Diana Ross career in general. So for Timothy Belavia, and you have to look at his page and um, his site. So I continue on with another song that I adore, which is Let's Go Up. I love it because it's a dance song and it is very uh, Diana Ross, if I can say. It's something that moves, that dances, that's very, very optimistic. It was also a hit for Helen Reddy, not a huge hit for Helen Reddy, but she sang it almost at the same time and it's a beautiful version as well. And Diana Ross made an appearance on the, the, the late night show, Johnny Carson, to, to sing that song right after her Central Park concert where uh, she was wearing the most stunning outfit you can imagine, a beige and silver uh, draped uh, uh, short gown suit. She looked so beautiful. I know I tell her that I tell you that she looked beautiful every time I describe her, but she was so magnificent. And Johnny Carson um, pressed the button and made it rain on the set so that she could feel right at home. So this is how much of a big deal the Central Park concert and show was not Ju July 2nd and July 3rd. Um, after that, you have the two songs that were produced by Ray Parker Jr. So now we go into that era of the 80s where disco had to be completely, completely pushed to the side and where everything had to have a little 
rocky edge to it, something a little rock. So Love or Loneliness, which is a ballad, uh, but you know, where you have a little bit of guitar and then straight up into Upfront, which is a uh, soft rock um, a song. Now, Diana Ross, I've always said, has the power in her voice to sing hard rock. And because she can go so high, uh, it just works with that kind of music. It's a way to soften that, that harshness. And it's just, you know, she really is completely at ease with that. And so Upfront was a single uh, also, and I think it was the last single that was uh, out for um, uh, this album. Then the last song, which is called Girls, um, I've always thought that it was dedicated to her uh, three daughters. Um, it's just a fun song. It just, you know, those songs that climb up, uh, very, very dance, and it is written by Diana Ross in part, um, because Diana Ross, when she entered RCA, began to write a little bit of her material. And it's really just a fun, fun song to end a great, stunning, beautiful red and pink album. So that is why I chose to wear um, the colors of the album and uh, a very, very exciting album. And this is the first album that I bought and when I arrived in Paris um, in 1983, I arrived in Paris in July 83, and posters of this album were all over the record stores, huge, huge, huge posters. And um, anywhere you went, she was the you know front and center. You could see the album and the cassette at the time. And uh, it was so exciting. And it was really, to me, like a kind of welcome to the city of Paris, which was uh, going to be very new to me um, and where I felt right at home. And uh, thank you so much. I know I was late for this video, but I was um, premiering a play uh, uh, and a show outside of Paris. And I wanted to really, really be um, very concentrated to talk about this album. That's why I waited and made you wait a little bit. Thank you all for your kind words. And I will see you next week with a follow up on the RCA year. See you next week.